Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service and welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar, part of our series of adult programs delivered differently. Thank you for joining us on such a glorious spring-like morning, which is very appropriate for our webinar topic today. This morning, we welcome herbalist, counsellor of myofacial release and craniosacral therapist, Patricia Bronzi, who will teach us how to strengthen and support our immune systems in alignment with the seasons by preparing and making good use of local plant medicine. Patricia is a traditional herbalist at heart and enjoys growing herbs organically, making herbal remedies and presenting herbal workshops. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for Patricia into the chat feed on your screen. And I'll ask these during a short break and also at the end of her presentation. Now sit back, grab a cuppa of herbal tea and please welcome Patricia Bronzi. Hi, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me well? I hope so. We can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I will do my sh screen share and I will minimise the questions so Tracy will take care of those. Um, okay. Right, can we all see the PowerPoint? Can you see the PowerPoint, Tracy? We sure can. Oh, awesome, okay. Before we start, I know that um, you already had um, acknowledgement of the Ghana people, but I'd just like to add a little bit more and acknowledge um, the ancestors of the land, past, present and future, and also something that um, not many people do, but I like to do, and that is acknowledge the plant world and give a big heartfelt thank you to all the plants that feed and heal us. Here we go, supporting the immune system. This is part one because we're going to be looking at spring and summer. Part two looks at autumn and winter and it is in alignment with the seasons. This is what I hope to deliver today. Um, oops, why aren't we moving forward? Down, okay. No. So, oh, there we go. Um, so what I'm aiming to um, share with you today is um, the basic function of the immune system, to just revisit that, and how to assist and support. Um, we're going to be looking at spring and summer. What's actually happening in spring and summer um, in our body? So um, having this information really makes a big difference um, to the herbs that you're going to use and what you will be um supporting your body with. So if you're looking in tune to the seasons, the body's channels of elimination because spring's all about cleansing. Um, we'll be looking at herbs to support and heal. Um, we'll be looking at foods, herbs in the season. We'll be looking at uh, detox, um, fast cleansing and um, talking about some of the extreme cleanses and what my thoughts are on that. And again, they're, they're my thoughts. Um, and of course, as always, safety and precautions. We're going to start off with, um, okay, just a little introduction before I move into believe in the body and not the disease. Um, the seasons of the year guide us and teach us how to flow with grace and ease. When we align our energy with the nature that surrounds us, we do not burn out. Rather, we are replenished and ready when it is time to go out and shine. Like a gentle and wise teacher, the earth uses her seasons to model when to rest and reflect, when to cleanse and activate, when to shine bright and create, and when to return back to self. So this is a big part of this presentation. Believe in the body and not the disease. It's a big one. I definitely by no means want, don't want to be misunderstood. I think it's important to know the disease, but I don't think there's enough in believing in the body. Um, learning about the disease is helpful, but learning about supporting your body and how your body works is as important, if not more important. When we start to develop symptoms, we don't like them. Nobody does. But the symptoms are really the beginning, the beginning of the body's attempt to regain balance. And it's a way that we ought to be working with it. 
The symptoms of the start of the cure, these are signs that the body's fighting. It's designed to do that, and when all goes well, we recover and maintain our health and vigour. And I totally get it. Sometimes we don't recover, and there is times when we need to intervene. These are the signs that the body's fighting. So believe in the body. These are, when the body is giving you these symptoms, I know it's hard just to go, okay, my immune system is working. What can I do to assist it? Support the natural processes. Again, I can give you an example of a fever, which is probably a really good one to give. A fever is designed to help you eliminate the infection that has invaded you or other illnesses. It's a fire. It wants to burn things up. Sometimes you do need to intervene. It just doesn't have a turn-off mechanism. But what we're seeing more and more in practice is these low-grade fevers, um, you know, these compromised fevers. So the natural process of having a fever and then perspiration cools you down, having done its job, sometimes can go astray. Now, please keep in mind that with babies, um, this does not apply what I'm talking about. Okay, babies need to be monitored very closely and they can easily have febrile convulsion. And that's a whole different topic, which we cover in Herbs for Children. So when I'm referring to this that I'm giving you today, it's on adults. So if we're supporting the natural processes like, say, the fever, <clears throat> we would not be suppressing it. We would not be grabbing those Panadol and other medication to suppress it. We'd actually be having a yip tea, which is yarrow, elderflowers and peppermint. And what that does, it supports the whole natural process of what the body was intended to do with mechanisms of diaphoretics, which means they also help perspiration because it's really important that once you've got your fire up, you're also cooling down. Now, at times, depending on the illness that has bestow you, um, you need to intervene. But most of the time, <clears throat> if you can just support this process, you know, just um, have, a good, have a good fire, burn it up, and um, I find the yep tea and other herbal teas are really good in supporting this process. So that's just an example because what happens if we keep grabbing um, paracetamol and other medication to suppress the fever, then our body, we're closing off pathway and the body's going to slowly and surely forget what it's meant to do. And again, I find herbs can bring the body back open up those pathways to remember what to do. Probably enough about that. We'll move on to the next one. When all goes well, we recover and maintain our health and vigour. And like I said, if all doesn't go well, then we don't recover and we may need to intervene and um, look at what needs to be done. I love this saying. I always go back to it. And I finally did find out who actually quoted it. So it's back a long time as you can see. First, the word. So when we have to intervene, let's look at what we need to do. The word, then the herb, then the drug, and last of all, the knife. I think if we can re remind ourselves in that order, you know, did the word do the trick for us? What about the herbs? Have I looked at the herbs that can help me, my green allies? The drugs, do I need to use them? And after we've exhausted everything, then there is no other options. Is the knife what's the best situation here? So everything has to be accounted for individually as what's required. But I really love that little saying. I carry it with me all the time. The many functions of the immune system. When we're looking at the many functions of the immune system, as I briefly described in the fever, uh, it's a case of use it or lose it. Because the ongoing suppression of a natural body function will over time hinder and compromise that function. 
When everything is working correctly, there is no need to intervene, trust in the body and support the natural processes. Before we go further, because I'm so used to seeing all of your faces and tuning into the audience that I have and working out whether you're still with me or whether, you know, what I said uh, went over your head and didn't make any sense. I'm just going to ask Tracy, do we have any questions on the introduction at the moment? Uh, not so far, Patricia, but um, Paula does say that she'd love to know how to try and avoid hay fever naturally because it's oh. obviously the, her her least favourite part of spring and probably everybody. So I'm sure you're going to cover that anyway. But um, I will. Let's just say that spring's all about cleansing <laughs> and people that have hay fever uh, are more than likely to have a congested liver. So the way that you help hay fever by getting to the cause, there's a lot of things you can take to relieve the nasty, horrible symptoms of it. But if you really want to get to the cause, probably looking at your liver or something else that's been compromised. So, um, yeah, if I don't answer that question fully at the end, please bring it up again and I can expand on it. Um, so the many functions of the immune system closely linked to proper function of all body systems. You cannot separate as a standalone system. So when we're talking about the immune system, it's, it's not like, it's it's everything. Everything impacts the immune system. Um, all the functions of the body. And spring and summer is a time for the liver and detoxifying. So spring's a very cleansing time and summer is a time to just have fun. <laughs> Get out there, socialise, you know, that shine. Use it or lose it, which we've talked about. I hope you know what I mean by that. Um, if, and I guess I'll start right up, uh, up front. I don't um, want to come across as I'm opposed to medication. Okay, I'm a herbalist and first of all, use your herbs, then the drug. Everything has a place. However, uh, medications can block natural processes in the body, which then the body forgets how to use them. So we've got to be mindful of that. Um, if we do need to use medication, and again, every, every case is different, sometimes you just need to use medication short term, that is ideal if, if required. And other times it seems to be like you need to go at ongoing. Well, if it's ongoing, I highly recommend that you start looking at other things that can help you. Um, sometimes there is things that can help, sometimes there isn't. Um, but just remember that if you've got something that's blocking a natural process, then over time the body is going to forget what it's meant to do and you have to relink those pathways. You can do it, but they have to be relinked, opened up. And that's the beauty of herbs. You know, herbs remind the body how to heal. You know, they open up forgotten pathways and used appropriately. Um, there is minimal, if no, side effects used appropriately. Ongoing suppression of a natural body function will, over time, hinder and compromise that function, as we have already mentioned. And when everything's working correctly, there's no need to intervene. And that's really important. When everything's working correctly, so is your body doing what it's really meant to be doing and all it's asking is for you to support it, even though it may feel uncomfortable? Or is there a need to intervene? Is the body forgotten or has something else happening you know maybe an endocrine disorder um you know a genetic predisposition that's really overshadowing the whole picture in there that you need to intervene because things are not going as as the body should be doing you know it's meant to heal itself but somehow things are just getting worse the magic bullet like i said at no time do i want to come across as polarised, everything has a place. It's about education. And we are just so fortunate to have so much education thrown at us. It be a little bit too much sometimes to confuse us. But if you use everything appropriately, um, you will find that it can serve you well. Um, the trouble I have with medication is that often doctors, and really good doctors, don't have anything else to offer you, and, and that's sad. 
And so magic bullet was a term um, described by Barbara Craig in her book um, Green Pharmacy. It's a bit of a classic. I'm sure the library has it. Um, it's not a feel-good read, but it really brings home the history of herbal medicine and the history of medicine. And so if there's no need to intervene, don't intervene. But the magic bullets were labelled that because they were magic. And sure, if you took one little pill and everything was fixed, wonderful. But it's not like that, is it? You take one little pill and it just band-aids over um, what the body's trying to correct. Um, so it's really, and I'm probably going to repeat this quite a few times today, it's always try to remember that we're looking at the cause of the imbalance rather than deal with just the symptoms. You know, because dealing with just the symptoms isn't going to really give you what you're looking for, and that is to move forward and heal, support your body, clear pathways, you know, really work on it. Because as you get older, all you're going to end up with is Band-Aid over Band-Aid and the real cause is still there. Magic bullets are invaluable discoveries. They save lives. And it's using them appropriately. And I do feel quite saddened when um, doctors don't have things to offer. Um, many doctors are starting to um, educate themselves on what else there is, which is wonderful, um, but there's still a big majority that don't have anything else to offer you. And, of course, when you use these magic bullets, these pharmaceuticals, always with discretion. Um, just seeing if there's anything else. Okay, overuse <clears throat> is the issue. This may have eventuated due to our lack of understanding or apathy. The misadministration of pharmaceuticals and co-partners do backfire with disastrous effects. We have witnessed this on many occasions, which prompted the discontented general public to bring about the renaissance of natural therapies. Yes, they do have side effects and they can backfire. So just to repeat myself, the cause of the illness, the cause of the disease, the imbalance, that's what we want to really get to. And work with a practitioner. Now, no one practitioner is everyone's practitioner, God forbid. <laughs> So I say to my clients, you know, um, the first session is about working out whether we, we, we're suited, you know, to work together. And they look at me and I go, you'll know. And you will know. And when you find the practitioner you can work with, because that's what you're doing, you're working together and trying to see what the cause is and what is the best um, solution to all that you're bringing to the table. Cause of the illness. Pharmaceuticals do not address the cause of the immune malfunction. The administration and pharmaceutical co-partners do backfire with disastrous effects and they provide band-aids. They buy us time and that sometimes is really needed. It's wise to always follow up treatment with restorative herbal remedies. So first the word, then the herb, then the drug. And sometimes you have to take a step back, back to the, if you use the drug you have to go back to the herb. It's just buying your time. But restorative herbal remedies, um, to me, uh, are what knowledge the, um, the public needs and good, solid knowledge, especially to do with what grows in your back garden, which is what I've really taken um, a passion towards. Because herbal medicine is the people's medicine and that means that you ought to have this knowledge available and be supported in use of it in your everyday life. Now, we're just going to spend a little bit of time in looking at our immune system. I know you want to get to the herbs, but we'll get there. Our immune system. If microbes get past these defences and invade the body, the immune system, the most complex system of the body, is altered and finally orchestrated to attack, to orchestrated attack begins. The focus needs to be on working with the innate healing system of the body, reinstating normal and healthy operative functions. This in turn strengthens the body and results in strong, healthy immune system, which evolves to protect itself, the innate healing system of the body. Let's just say 
that when there is an imbalance, when we're talking about the immune system, regaining health and vigour, it's not all just physical. So there is a big component which is emotional and there's so much more that the cause could be coming from. Um, and I do particularly love working with imprints, you know, ancestral imprints, things that were just handed down, you know, they're not fault of your own. You may not even be aware of them. They could be hidden in that little box called the subconscious. But they, they make a huge impact to people's ability to get well and stay well. So it would be totally um, unfair for me not to mention the role that the emotional body plays on our well-being and, of course, our immune system function. There we go. The body is well equipped. Here we go, the immune system, the first line mechanism preventing invasion, eyes. So remember that we can't separate the immune system. It's, everything's connected. But I'm just giving you some examples, like the eyes. They have antiseptic tear. The nose has sticky mucus and has hairs that trap microbes. These sneeze and expel dirt and microbes. The skin, the skin is amazing. Secretes seep um, and antiseptic oils. The skin needs to breathe. It's uh, one of the biggest detoxifying organs. The liver's probably the biggest. Uh, intestine, bacteria, checks unwanted organisms. There's, there's a whole lot of ecology happening on our skin, on our intestine, everywhere. And the bowels and bladder that eliminate toxins. Work with and support reinstating healthy operative functions. You want to be able to strengthen your body. Results in a strong, healthy immune system. Immune system evolving to protect itself. And then we've mentioned the psycho neuroimmunology, which is the emotion with effect. The body is well equipped. It's a first line of defence, preventing invasion, such as we've said the eyes and the sneezing. Just having a quick look. If microbes get past these defences, they invade the body, the immune system, the most complex system of the body is alerted and the finally orchestrated attack begins. The immune system cells compromise about 25% of the body's approximately 100 trillion cells. There are many cells, tissues and organs involved, also referred to as the body's second brain remembering everything that ever entered. So I think we've got a good understanding that the immune system is not a standalone system and it works together. Now, how do we assist our immune system? Well, this is not going to be new to any of you, I'm sure. Organic whole foods, we, we really need to... Um, I'll just see if there's any questions before I go into this. Any questions, Tracy? Ah, uh, there's one so far from Vic okay. asking what they can do for congested sinuses um, with thick white mucus in the throat, sometimes cough, etc. Um, they've been taking Senega and ammonia and it doesn't seem to be helping. Ah, uh, it's back to the individual, isn't it? You all want to get to that part, right. I'll be as quick as I can to allow plenty of time for when we get to that part, which goes through the herbs and what they can do for you. Excellent. Thank you, Tracy. Um, just want to know where you all are, so I can see you all want to be at the at that bit of the thing. So organic foods, organic plants, herbs, it's really important, especially when talking about medicine or anything, you, you, you know, we've got to support this system. So let's have a look. Let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. This is as old as old can be, Hippocrates said it, and herbalists just love this saying. Diet should be seen as the foundation of any healing regime. Ancient Eastern traditions have demonstrated for thousands of years that while dietary changes can be slower to create an obvious effect, their power is deep and lasting. The ancients used foods to moisten, cleanse, strengthen, move energy, calm the mind and reduce mucus. Food is a tool to purify and regain balance, which allows us to tune in, clear out and prevent approaching illnesses. Yes. You're going to hear it over and over and over and over again. Um, what you put in your mouth makes a difference. So try and get as many wholesome organic foods as possible. Um, some raw foods are really good because of the enzyme, but not everybody responds to raw foods, especially if you have a lot of coldness in you. It's contraindicated. But when you put something in your mouth, <clears throat> become aware of your body. 
how did it react to what you just ate? It's a really good thing to be aware of. Okay, assist your body with, you know, all the things. I'm just going to have a little drink of water. My throat's getting a bit dry. <coughs> Clean air and water. Clean environment, exercise. There is no substitute for any of these things. Herbs are on top of it. Rest, sunlight, healthy mind, joyful attitude, compassionate and loving heart. Okay. Sunshine. I just love this and I wanted to share it with you. Yes, vitamin D is great. And the best way to get it, take a walk in the sunshine. Now, there is at times the need to supplement in vitamin D. And that's when things have gone not quite right. So if you are still spending time in the sunlight and sunshine and your vitamin D is low, something else is happening, okay? But really... And I got this from actually from a specialist just recently. We have um, a concerning number of very young children with vitamin D deficiency. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, it's amazing. You know, they all have to go in and, and have their supplement um, on vitamin D monthly um, because, of course, vitamin D deficiency um, causes all sorts of distress. And he said it's because of the sunscreen. You know, we've almost raised a generation fearful of going out in the sun. So we need that balance. Sure, we don't want skin cancer, but we do need vitamin D, sunshine. Yes, exercise is great, and the best way to get it, take a walk in the sunshine. And, gee, today it's a gorgeous day to take a walk. Relieving stress is important, and the best way to do it, take a walk in the sunshine. Then come back inside, eat a hearty meal. I love that. So really, we just have to constantly remind ourselves, take a walk in the sunshine. Hey, this is where you all wanted to get to. <laughs> Herbs remind the body how to heal. Plants, duality, have been both foods and medicine as essential healing interactions between plants and people. Many herbs are available for the fatigue, the stressed and unwell. Healing with herbs is an ancient art. All humans are capable of learning this knowledge. However, it is extensive. And common sense is profoundly called upon. <clears throat> Before I go back there, I just have to say a little bit more in my notes. Um, six, so as I share this herbal knowledge, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. So please, don't just take it, run it if you're not sure. If in doubt, don't. <laughs> That's my advice. If you're ever in doubt of anything, don't. Find out first. So seek professional advice when situations are life-threatening. Do not delay medical attention. Many people in pharmaceutical drugs um, are using and can use herbal remedies, but you need to find out what drug you're on and do these herbs interfere with that drug. Make sure there is no contraindication before self-administering. There are so many herbs available to lend a helping hand to the fatigue and stress. I think we've already said that. Um, you know your limitations, know your limitations, and consult a herbalist or naturopath to support and guide you in choosing good quality herbs suitable to for yourself. The nature of healing with herbs is ancient, available to all of us. Um, and be 100% sure before ingesting or applying anything to yourself and others. So please take note of, of, you know, what I'm saying. Spring. Spring is the time for the liver and the gallbladder. The focus is on internal cleansing. Spring is the season of the liver, the gallbladder, and summer is uh, the season for the heart and the small intestine. Late summer is the spleen and the stomach. Now, I know that we're not going to have as much time as I would have loved. Um, and, you know, an hour and a half webinar is quite a lot to just pay attention to. But what I've done is I've given you, because um, you can request this PowerPoint, by the way, Tracy probably has mentioned that to you, you can request it and it will be sent to you. Um, there's a lovely link there from Leslie Tierra. 
And she has a lovely article that explains, uh, you know, what happens in spring. If spring winds invade, so spring is windy, okay? Uh, if um, spring winds invade and stir internal wind, they cause tension, stiffness, spasm, ticks, pumpiness, numbness, headaches, allergies. So somebody was asking about hay fever, okay? The, the wind is stirring things. Convulsion, itching, skin conditions. The liver then becomes congested resulting in anger, frustration, irritability, stiff neck and shoulders, hypertension, post-menstrual um, syndrome, depression, mood swings, irregular menstruation. People who feel worse in spring often have congested livers. And most people with hay fever need to look at their liver. Well, just about everybody has to look at their liver in the times that we're living in. Uh, those who experience red face and eyes, irritability, outbursts of anger, dizziness, migraines, insomnia, have excess heat in the liver. So getting to know yourself, is it, is it heat in the liver that I'm experiencing? Is it coldness? Is it dampness? Is it dryness? Because knowing that is going to give you an understanding of which herbs to use. One man's poison is another man's medicine. And what I mean by that is if you pick the wrong herbs to not help you balance, you're not going to get the results. Um, so it's all very well to put a herb in the spotlight and glorify it. Um, but, you know, the big question that I would say is, is that herb for you? So try it. See what happens. Always be mindful of what happens once you've taken something. Prolonged in ingestion of caffeine, alcohol, sugar, fried foods, that creates a lot of um, heat in the liver. To balance spring's energy, eat plenty of dark green leafy vegetables. And we have got so many in the garden at the moment. They're called weeds. There's so many edible weeds out there. They're the best greens you ever, ever eat. Um, I'm not sure if Tracy mentioned it to you, but at the end of the PowerPoint, uh, I've got some dates of scheduled um, healing with herbs walk and talk in Patrizia's herb garden, so my garden here. Due to COVID, we're only I'm only having six people and we're practicing social distancing and everything. But the garden's looking amazing at the moment, and I want to share it. I want to share my plants. I want to share my knowledge, and I want to share some cuttings and some seeds, which is all included in the price. And so there is just so many, you know, uh, chickweed. Chickweed is an amazing plant, you know, really breaks down the fat if you've got a lot of um, a lot of fat build up. And then you've got cleavers, you know, cleavers. Um, you know, they are so wonderful for the lymphatic system, not to mention the violets. They congest the lymphatic system. Uh, other may experience dampness and heat. And there's a whole section. So I'm just reading off um, Leslie's Tierras. Oh, and of course, you know, Go to sleep by 11 p.m. That's probably, just in case you don't read the article, it's probably a really good point to make. Um, most, if you go to bed late at night, you're not doing yourself any favours. So between 10 and 2 is the time that the body is doing most of its replenishing. So it's a good idea to get as much of sleep in those times. According to Leslie, um, the liver is between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. So sometimes I say to people, you know, who need to work on their liver, take this before you go to bed and when you wake up because that's the time the liver is going to be very active and so getting those herbs in your body is going to help a lot. Um, if you start gently stimulating herbs, fasting, we're going to mention that. So have a read of Leslie's um link. Fresh greens, weeds are in abundance, green are detoxifying and alkalizing, chlorophyll closely resembles hemoglobin. I've got to admit I am in love with stinging nails. I'm in love with so many plants out there but stinging nails have been one of those that I have really, really come to be really close with and we will be talking about stinging nettles but when I have stinging nettle tea or when I eat stinging nettles um, and that they, this time of the year, they have that amazing green, fluorescent green. 
and it honestly feels like I'm having a blood transfusion. It's so good. Um, it's almost like a pure, clean blood transfusion. Cleansing your blood, tissues and organs. Spring tips for healthy liver, we're looking at this. Okay. Summer is the season for the heart and the small intestine. It's um, the earth, colour is red. The prime time for healing the heart. Love, sharing and connection. Uh, expansion, fresh, simple, light food. So it's interesting because summer's the time when we're out there. We're, we're, we're connecting to everyone. We're having such a good time. Our hearts are, you know, open for all of that. Late summer, the five season in Chinese medicine. See it as the spleen and the stomach, stability and rootness. So I, like I said, it's very much about being in one with and accepting the seasons and working with your body and what is happening. So it's very valuable information. We're going to be looking at uh, bodies, channels of elimination, and then we're going to be going into the herbs for these channels. So bodies, channels of elimination, the bowels, the liver, lymphatics, skin, kidneys, lungs, immune-specific organs, thymus manufactures cell and produces hormones that coordinate the immune activity. Spleen acts as a blood reservoir, bacteria are engulfed and destroyed, red blood cells and platelets processed and eliminated. Okay, what have we got next for you? Liver and gallbladder. The liver produces the bile and the bile itself has a mild laxative effect. Liver prime site of detoxification of drugs and toxic chemicals. Processes many of the body's hormone, especially estrogen. Crucial in metabolism and carbohydrates, fats and protein. And I have got a little short video, very educational. It's from Can, um, K -H, um, K -H -A -N Academy. They have some really good little short educational videos. So I encourage you, um, if you've requested this webinar, to click on that link and have a look. It's only about six minutes long, very educational. Because the more that you can learn about your body, the more that you can be at peace and listen to it, um, the more that you will help yourself. Stimulate liver detoxification. Okay, it's where you all wanted to get to, we're there. Okay, dandelions growing everywhere. If you don't know what a dandelion looks like, and remember you've got to be 100% sure before you uh, ingest anything or offer it to anyone. Come along to one of the walks. I, like I said, I've only got six people and um, I did email uh, my emailing list and two of the days are just about booked up. Um, but I've opened up another one earlier for the attendance of, of this webinar because I thought your knowledge will be still at the forefront and you'll be able to relate even more so to the herbs that I can introduce you to. All you need is dandelion seeds and you can grow your own dandelion. Dandelion root uh, is especially good for the liver, but the whole dandelion, you know, um, the root is more specific, we say, for the liver, but the whole thing is good for the liver, for the kidneys, and the flowers are amazing for your eyes. Okay, so um, anything that's bitter is good for your liver, so they are a little bit bitter. Um, but the root, we know that um, you can roast it and it tastes a bit like a coffee substitute, even though I think chicory tastes more like a coffee substitute. And chicory and dandelion have very similar properties, um, except that chicory has this red vein that just runs through it, you know. So I don't know. To me, um, when I look at chicory, it just says circulation because of that red vein that just comes through it. But of course, um, the red in it is um, the, the bitter line alkaloids, which are found in vitreous, which are very cleansing for the liver. If you've never had um, fresh beetroot, um, particularly steamed, I find works really well for people who have really congested liver. Um, you can still eat it raw, but I find when you steam it and you just cut it up and it's still warm, you cut it up and you put lemon juice and olive oil, it just some wonderful things to just move 
a congested liver. So much so that I say to people, don't eat too much of it. Um, but, yeah, dandelions are just amazing. And, um, you know, they grow freely everywhere. Um, important thing with wildcrafting is you're probably safer to do it in somebody's private property where you can ask, has it been sprayed? Unfortunately, um, in South Australia and other states, um, they are often sprayed to be managed and, um, of course, you don't want to get pick anything that's been sprayed. Even though I've noticed signs do go up, um, you know, please be mindful that they they're not considered um, valuable plants by all people and um, they want to be eradicated. Um, so, you know, have them in your garden and if somebody else has a whole lot of them, just ask them. But, yeah, dandelion is just an amazing plant. Um, what I do with the the leaves is I, um, the really young ones, I just put them in my salad with all my other greens. But the much bigger ones, I just blanch them in hot boiling water, not for very long. It just um, you know, these are big leaves and they're tough and they're not very palatable. So I just dunk them in hot boiling water, I drain them, chop them up, lemon juice and olive oil. It tends to be a standard with Italians. Uh, fumatory. Now, Fumaria officinalis dredges the liver. So you've got to go in small doses. Um, a lot of the uh, liver cleansing stuff, you've got to be just very mindful Um that if you've got a very congested liver, the last thing you want to do is go in too heavy. And you'll know because you'll start to feel nauseous, you start to feel unwell. So if that happens, drink a lot of water, pause on the herb that you were taking, go back to it when that's subsided in small doses. Please do not believe that you need to have really large doses for things to work. Everybody's different. Some people just need a very small dose and things move. Other people need a medium dose and some people need a really big dose to kick things started. So everybody's different. Dosing is an individually tailored thing. Fumera officinalis is another one that happens um, profusely. It's also called smoke bush because it just sort of goes over things and it's all of left patches in my garden because I will harvest. It can take over a little bit. Um, the red flowers, just a little bit, both the red, red pinkish, sort of a more of a, a dark pink uh, flower is um, probably a little bit stronger than the white one, but both can be used. And you can, if you don't mind bitters, just eat a little bit, like a you know, little sprig. Um, otherwise, um, I, I cannot sit down and have a fumatory um, cup of tea, but I just have them as tinctures. So if you're unsure uh, what tinctures and extracts are, just ask a question and I can expand on that. Um, but once you've picked the herb that you want to try for yourself, um, then how you take it in the form that you take it and in the dose that you take it is going to give you different results. So administration will give you a different physiological effect as will doses. Oregon Mountain Grape. Uh, it is one that I'm growing in my garden at the moment. I just love the berberine alkaloids that it contains um, and the wonderful uh, effect that it has, not just on the liver but on the gut. I use it a lot when there's a lot of um, unfavourable um, microbials imbalance in, in, in the bowel, in, in the stomach. Oregon Mountain Grape is not an easy plant to grow. Um, but I do have it in the garden. Of course, the beverine alkaloid is what, um, and when we talk about beverine alkaloids, when we talk about constituents and plants, you know, um, it just gives us a little bit more understanding of the plant, but in no time are any of the other components in the plant less valuable. You know, it's whole plant medicine is what I practice, and I like to see the whole biological complexity of the plant to be used because it has a much more favourable effect. Shizandra, unfortunately can't grow this one, but I cannot be without it. Um, most of it comes from China, and I'm very careful of what I buy from China. I was able to get it from Russia for a while, but it hasn't been available for a really long time. They do have certified organic, so I am trusting the company that I buy from that um, the certification, which is Australian, is very much that. Uh, and there is parts of China that are not totally polluted, especially up in the mountains. 
Um, but Shizandra, if you've never tasted a Shizandra berry and you come to my walk, please ask and I'll, I'll get them, I'll get a little sample, although we've got to be very careful um, with the whole COVID protocol, um, but we can work with that. Of course, um, there'll be no cups of tea for our walks at the moment. Uh, unless I get everyone to bring a cup, I don't know, I'll think about that. Anyway, uh, Shizandra, uh, chemical liver damage, poor liver function, improves the toxification and capacity of the liver, really helps um, phase two detoxification of the liver, helps the kidneys, it just makes you feel stronger. Juniper and psyllidine cleanse. Now, I started using this in the clinic probably for a little bit more than a year. I came across it from a colleague that I studied with. Um, so he did the same course that I did with Jenna Stewart, and I came across this from him, and um, it really made a lot of sense. Um, and I've now used it myself, and many of my students and my clients have used it, and I've had some really good feedback. There's one lady, though, that um, just one juniper berry has given her nausea, so we were exploring what that is, you know. Um, it could be that juniper is doing an amazing job and she needs it so much, but she only needs a little bit. Or it could be that Juniper's not for her. We're not too sure yet. We're working with that in a really um, um, slow, progressive way. But Juniper and Celandine Cleanse is basically, um, I'll give a handout. Juniper is enough to get. Uh, greater Celandine tincture, not so. Um, I use a mother tincture, so that means it's a, a 1 in 10 fresh plant, and I find that that's nice and gentle. Uh, greater celandine for those who do know the plant and um, the almost orange deep yellow almost orange um, sap that comes out of it is quite corrosive if you get it on your skin so you can imagine what it will do when it goes inside of you but it is one that helps the liver a lot I've used it a lot as a homeopathic remedy but definitely not in tangible big doses. You've got to be careful with that. So I find the very gentle mother tincture with the juniper berries do beautifully. And all it is, it's, um, you know, you, you just get the berries. You start off with about, start with one at first, and then you build up to, say, three, and you slowly dissolve them in your mouth so it goes through your mucosa rather than just pop them. Because juniper is actually a really potent antiviral works on your kidneys and it's very cleansing. However, if you have any susceptible kidney diseases, it's not for you, okay? And celandine, again, if you've got an extremely congested liver or if you've got things happening with your pancreas, you've got to go really, really gentle and maybe homeopathic may be the way to go. But this um, juniper and celandine cleanse, it's so lovely to do. You slowly increase the berries as you increase the drops with water and you do it first thing in the morning. You do it for two weeks and then you have a break. And I just love hearing the feedback uh, of people that have tried it. Now, another one, liver protecting herbs. We have the globe artichoke leaves and root of the scenario. Now, that's that one there. Um, I haven't got it in my garden at the moment, but I do grow it from time to time just so that I can have my own plant medicine with no chemicals. Um, milk thistle seeds, silly marium, um, silly bum marianum. Um, it's amazing. Um, look, you can take it as a tincture. It's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, so when you uh, tincture as an extract, so you should make it alcohol and alcohol will extract things. That water doesn't. But uh, milk thistles are quite tasty and um, you, they're hard to get, but I do have them in stock. Um, organic, of course. You can go and harvest your own, but it's a very prickly plant. Um, you can toast them and have them with, mixed in with your other nuts and seeds. Or you can just ground them um, and get quite a tangible, you know, one or two teaspoons a day into you. And you will notice the difference. You will probably notice that your bowels start to work better. So if um, you have a tendency for constipation, it's usually a sign that you, you live in its health. Um, yeah, but milk thistle. Um, and milk thistle really enhances the function of the liver. 
okay, it protects it and enhances it. And good for poisoning, um, it was documented uh, for mushroom poisoning many, many years ago. And this is another one, Glyphlorum, which no, I don't have growing, but it's another one that, again, I can't be without, and it is a Chinese herb, um, beautiful, wonderful herb. Turmeric, we've all heard about turmeric, haven't we? Well, let's just say turmeric is amazing, but when you buy the products that are curcumin, curcumin is an active constituent in turmeric, and when you buy medicine that says curcumin, check the label because that's all it is, it's curcumin. It's one aspect of turmeric. And it's not the whole plant. It's not the whole um, biological complexity of turmeric. Now, I came across an article by David Winston, W-I-N-S-T-O-N, -S and um, totally he just pretty well um, said it like I think it. You know, um, some people um, who have had just turmeric and, you know, Cooking with turmeric, we know that uh, black pepper uh, makes it more bioavailable and a little bit of oil uh, when you cook it in your curry that's like traditionally it was used, it, it enters your system and is absorbed far better. Um, there is evidence that says you need really large doses. Well, it depends. I've met lots of people who have just had um, turmeric as a drink and have responded and noticed benefits, uh, capsules and have responded and benefits. Um, I don't tend to use this one very much in a fluid extract. I don't know why, I just don't. I just tend to use it more as a food or in capsules and uh, make paste and drinks out of it. Um, but the idea is to get really good quality uh, turmeric. Uh, it protects against the liver damage. It regenerates affected liver cells and improves the health of the gallbladder. And also when you start taking turmeric, uh, especially, you know, you might make a little paste and a drink out of it, go easy. Go easy, you know, if you, again, have that really congested liver that needs a lot of help, you may start to feel a bit nauseous with it. But just go easy, just constantly monitor yourself. A number of studies have linked it to effectively combating liver, liver cancer and improving liver fibroids. What's more, turmeric can uniquely assist the enzymes that are responsible for brushing out the known dietary carcinogens. Um, the moment you heat oil and add turmeric to it, it now becomes completely bioavailable to you and, of course, the addition of black pepper. But, um, yeah, turmeric is definitely worthy of a look. It's been flogged to death by the market. But just take home message, is coumarin the same as turmeric? No, coumarin is a, uh, active in turmeric and some preparations out there are just that active. They're not the whole plant. Tonic herbs. Um, I'll just pause there. Tracy, any questions? Uh, there are quite a few coming through, Patricia. So I'm let's, just let's going to... All right, let's have a go. First of all, um, there are a couple of people asking where is your um, herb walk? So let's get that one out the way first. Okay. <laughs> sure. So it is a, I did put it in the last slide, but sure, we can um, definitely repeat that. So my herb walk is um, in Port Nalunga South. So my clinic in Port Nalunga is at my residential address. It's um, at the back of the herb garden. I have a clinic and then I have my home. The garden is front and back. It's a modest garden, you know, by no means is it acres of it. It's just a, a normal old house block, you know. Um, but it has so much packed in it. It has lots packed in it. And um, the herb walks are going to be now, I'd have to get my diary. I know there's one scheduled on the 12th of September. So they're all happening in September because the garden has just gone, wow, I'm awake, I'm alive, look at me. And I went away for a week and I've just come back and I can't believe how all these, and I call them blessed weeds. So any weed that I can use, I did definitely don't detest, I call it blessed weed. So all these blessed weeds are just everywhere. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to start harvesting. I'm going to be eating a lot of them. And I thought, let's hit these herb walks in really quick. So I'm going to be doing um, one that I haven't advertised yet. And I thought I'd leave it just for you guys because numbers are listed. Numbers are only going to be six. 
Okay, normally they're no more than 10, sometimes I've had 12, but because of COVID, we've all got to be mindful, so it's six. And, and that's going to be held on Thursday, the 3rd of September, 10 till noon. And what do you do? Well, at the end of this, there will be my phone number, my mobile number. Texting me is the best way for me. Um, and then I will send you the information on how to pay, which is just a direct into my account. Once you've paid, you're secured because I've only got a limited six people. Or you can email. The email takes a bit longer. So I've got the 3rd of September. The 12th of September, which is a Saturday, I've got two places left. I've already got four people booked in. And then I've got one more on the 16th, which I've got one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three. I've got another two people left to go in that one. I've got a few question marks next to come name. So as soon as you've paid, you're locked in. I'm having three herb walks at Port Nalunga South. Uh, address and um, bank details are forwarded. Just all you've got to do if you're interested is just send me a text or an email. Uh, the cost for it is $30. That does include many seeds and cuttings. Okay, so everybody I will request brings a little bag. And I, as I go along, I'll have my sick of tears and I snip and cut. Sometimes you're lucky enough, you might get some little seedlings that I go, oh, you need a new home. Who'd like a new home for this one? And you pop that in your bag as well. And then envelopes. <clears throat> so you can write what they are and we put the seeds inside them. And, of course, if you bring your own envelopes, your own bag and your own pencil, you're not touching anybody else's. I hope that answers that question. Any Thank other you questions? so much. Yes, that does answer that. And I have popped Patricia's email address and phone number already into the feed so you can grab those information there or at the end of the slide. Um, Somebody's asked, what is yarrow? Oh, okay, we haven't got to yarrow. Yarrow is a wonderful herb. It's a warrior's herb. Uh, yarrow is just about good for everything. And it is growing in my garden, and you're going to be more than welcome to have a little cutting or just pull up a little, a little bit of a runner for you. And you can grow your own, and I will explain to you how to grow it. It is wonderful for circulation. It is one of those mint herbs, stops bleeding. Um, it's good for the kidneys as well. Um, you know, it has a lovely flushing effect. Yarrow is one of the um, ingredients in the yep tea. So yep is short for yarrow, elder and peppermint. Um, it's a wonderful diaphoretic. Diaphoretic is something that helps the body produce perspiration. Perspiration will cool you off naturally. Uh, and also perspiration uh, opens up the skin and allows you to detoxify. So some people who don't perspire very well, I have told them, look, just have a, a yip tea, even though, you know, they haven't got a fever or anything or we're not trying to reinstate the uh, pathways of, uh, you know, proper fever function. Uh, I just go, look, you know, just, just get to see how this tea feels for you. And they love it because it's so nice tasting. They love it and they go, I'll go, well, well start including everyday life, you know, start having one or two cups a day and see what happens. And all of a sudden they go, you know what, I'm now perspiring, not overly perspiring, just now I can feel my skin opening up and, and maybe, you know, I've had a bit of a, a cleanse and, you know, I've come out with some pimples and stuff, you know, but the pores have opened up and they're perspiring. So yarrow is an amazing herb. There's, um, I've got yellow yarrow, which I don't tend to use a lot. It smells very differently than the others. Uh, I've got white yarrow and pink yarrow. The white and pink I use a lot. I'm a little bit down on pink. I'm going to have to pot up another plant. Pink doesn't seem to be taking off as much as the white. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. Any other questions, Tracy, before we continue on? There is one from Cosette about neti pot, but are you going to cover that later or shall no, I ask you the question? I don't think I've got neti pot. I know what neti pot is. Look, neti pots are fine for rinsing out your uh, nasal passages. All I can say is don't overdo it. Okay, because when you're rinsing out your nasal passages, you're also rinsing out some of the good bacteria. Okay, so yeah, wonderful, wonderful for cleansing out your sinuses if you need to. Um, and you can use some herbs, but don't overdo it. Okay, but yeah, neti pots are, are good. The other thing that's good, and I suppose um, a lot of people do use neti pots in hay fever season, you know, just to flush out their sinuses. The other thing that's really good as a, as a as a bit of an aid. I mean, there's lots of herbal teas. And I've got a hay fever tea that I sell heaps of it. 
you know, because um, just drinking the tea really helps. And homeopathics um, are good for, you know, the, the horrible symptoms of hay fever. Um, but also you can buy these little nasal filters. Okay, you're going to look a bit silly, but, hey, it's okay. <laughs> if we have to wear a mask, then we probably don't need your nasal filters. But um, little nasal filters, and they just sort of slot into your nasals and they just um, filter out all the pollen and stuff. And, and that really helps if you are a bad sufferer of hay fever and um, you need to go out there. So the, the, there is quite a few things. Any Excellent. other questions? Yeah, and also the mask will cover the nasal yeah Thing of me. yeah that's right and and in these times you know nobody's going to think of you much not even look at you twice if you're wearing a mask exactly so, um, exactly there's one from Paula so she says she's a caffeine addict and would the amount of coffees and red bulls she has Ooh. per day be hurting her immune system oh absolutely my dear You'd be totally exhausting your adrenals, which is your fight and flight. You're overstimulating your um, nervous system. And when you start, when you decide to start uh, addressing it, you are more than likely going to get those terrible caffeine withdrawal headaches, which can be helped with homeopathics. Um, but look, um, what I say to people who are really strong coffee drinkers, wean yourself off. And one of the things that you can do, which I've done, I mean, I'm Italian, I like my little short blacks, you know, and um, but even a little short black first thing in the morning was just a bit too much for my, for my nervous system. So what happens is if you're having all these overstimulating um, beverages and foods, then you've got your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, okay? So one is the get up and go fight, and the other one is the um, relax and digest. And they need to be in balance. What we're finding is the vagus nerve um, is to do with uh, the relax and digest. So if that part of your nervous system is not operating properly, you're going to have a hell of a lot of problems, especially with your digestion. Uh, and we know that the gut is the second brain, so you, you're going to have a lot of neurological and psychological um, problems. So we look, the vagus nerve is amazing. That could be just another path on on its own. But what I'm going to say to Paula is, um, you know, wean yourself slowly and, and, and see how it feels. Um, because people usually use these stimulants to help with tiredness. But in the end, you know, you can't flog a dead horse expression, my my expression. And and so when you start weaning yourself off, you actually start finding yourself revitalizing. So yeah. Okay, should we continue on and we'll save the other questions to a little, little bit later? Is that okay? Certainly, yep, let's keep yeah. going. Okay, so we've got common useful herbs, tonic herbs like chamomile and lemon balm. Now, you know, chamomile is such a common herb that uh, a lot of European people would have grown up with eye surfeited. And yet it's one that we often forget, you know. I use chamomile a lot in, the, in my clinic when I formulate, when I make up formulas, and I love it for its anti-inflammatory properties. I love it for, um, for its li gentle liver. I love it for all sorts of things, uh, for its calming effect. Um, but yeah, and lemon balm. Lemon balm's another beauty. Look, it tastes really yummy. And chamomile and lemon balm together actually make a really nice tea. Hyssop. So these are tonics to um, for the liver. There's so many of them. This is just a few. Uh, hyssop, hibiscus flowers, and rosemary. Rosemary. I am surprised how many people have not had a rosemary tea. I encourage you if you've got a rosemary bush, any type of rosemary. Uh, they all taste a little bit different. Uh, often in class, we all, we often have rosemary tea and the delight of the students' feedback, you know, how their memory has sharpened and how they just feel generally better. Well, no wonder. Rosemary is an amazing herb and you can have it as a tea just to help you. And then if you need it at a more therapeutic level, you can you can have a tincture or an extract. Um, but rosemary... Wonderful for circulation. It's an excellent antioxidant. 
And when we talk about antivirals, there's so many antivirals out there. I'd kind of put that one in there as well. Um, gently cleanses the liver. And it gently cleanses mother's milk as well. So you have it really weak for a nursing mother and you only have one cup. And I got that information from a midwife in Israel when I did a workshop many, many years ago for the International Midwifery Conference. Uh, what a lovely bunch of ladies. And uh, a lady from Israel came up and said to me how they used rosemary tea, really weak rosemary tea, one cup, to cleanse the milk. So it has a really cleansing effect on the whole body. It's a wonderful cognitive enhancer, so it really sharpens your rosemary from memory. It really sharpens your memory and your brain function. So it's not just to be added to your lamb roast. It can be put in a teapot. Uh, you don't need a lot. Look, one sprig in a teapot, let it brew for five, ten minutes and start drinking it. Um, and, you know, have one, two, three cups a day, however much you think you need. And over a period of time, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen instantly, even though it can for some people, um, you will notice this wonderful, wonderful uh, benefit that you're deriving from it. Hyssop is, um, oh, just love the antiseptic feel of hyssop. Also good for the nervous system. Root vegetables support and detoxify the liver. So you can grow your own burdock. Burdock um, is a deep cleanser. You know, whenever I work with burdock, you know, I or when I harvest and I get this picture of burdock being so deep into the ground and it just keeps showing me this picture of a big wooden spoon in a pot and giving it a stir, and, you know, and says, that's the stagnant pond. I'm stirring the stagnant pond. I'm bringing things up, you know. So I really love it. And... It can be grown easily um, from the seed and you can roast it um, and use it just like a root vegetable or you can dry it and make yourself a decoction, so uh, not an infusion. You need a little bit more heat for that one. And it's a wonderful herb for inulin. Inulin is what uh, feeds your good bacteria in your gut and you can get all that from a, uh, a plant, which is amazing to grow in your garden for free, so... Just need the knowledge to go with it. As we talked about beetroot, beetroot, a very powerful cleanser and a wonderful tonic. Carrots, radishes, and what have I got? The bowels. How are we going with time? Do I have to speed up a little bit? Yes, I do. Okay, bowels, colon, colon health, function of the bowels, small and large intestine, absorb nutrients from foods we eat, eliminates waste. If bowel movements are reduced, absorption and elimination may be impaired. Important at least one bowel motion a day. Um, do, 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 colon health. Okay. Here we go. Bell support. Water. I know. It's simple, but it's needed. You need to be well hydrated. Your bowels are not going to work properly if you're not. And like I said before, the health of your liver will determine your bowel motion. Exercise. Yep. Fibre. Whole grain foods, fruit and vegetables, rice, bran, wheat bran and wheat gem. For some people, those don't suit if you have problems. Flax seeds and um, psyllium uh, husks. Now, psyllium husk, um, a wonderful colon cleanse with psyllium husk. I didn't actually put it on there. Oh, I don't think I did. No, I didn't. But there's a wonderful uh, website, naturechoice.co.za. If you just punch in psyllium husk fibre, which sort of uh, explains how I get people to take it, um, which is basically as a drink and it's a bulking agent and then on an empty stomach and then be well hydrated with more water. And that um, sort of sits as a big wallace in your stomach and attracts all the toxins to it. So if you want to read a little bit more about that, you can probably don't have, um, due to time, I'll just skip over that. Um, and include it in my um, slide as a little link. Chai seeds, amaranth, quinoa. So, oh, here we go. I did actually add it. There we go. Sorry. Um, forgot about that slide. So there, it's, it's all there. So um, you can read that and you can practice it. Look, I found uh, that people's, believe it or not, uh, people's cholesterol has actually lowered by doing this. Um, people's sugar levels have actually lowered by doing this. And... Um, and a real bonus is um, people's weight has reduced by doing this because I, I usually advise people to do it at night, you know. After you've had your meal about 6 o'clock, 
you let it digest. And so by about seven and eight is when you're kind of sitting down, relaxing and going, oh, I really would like a snack or don't have a snack, have this. And, you know, let go to bed with this. And you feel quite full because it just sits in your, in your gut and adheres all the toxins and you have a really good bowel motion. You can add some um, flax seeds to it, ground it up, and that adds like a little bit of a scar on the colon just to clean it. Uh, fermented foods, look, I think everybody um, knows about fermented foods. Uh, I don't think I need to spend too much time on fermented foods. Um, they are wonderful for you. Get them in your diet. Uh, learn how to make them for yourself. They do improve your health, gut health, um, your health, good health is determined by your gut. So Trifala powder. Now, this is one that is not commonly known, um, and it's three uh, Ayurvedic Indian herbs that are used a lot in India, and they're very safe for long-term use, and it just does absolute wonders for um, enhancing uh, the absorption of your uh, enhanced digestion, absorption and elimination um, and safe to use for anyone. They even use it in infants to elderly. Um, Michael Tierra has a really good article about Trafala powder. Um, look, it doesn't taste the best, um, but I think it's important to taste your herbs. So when I make my capsules, I add another dessert spoon or so of powder to coat the capsules on the outside so that when you put the capsule in your mouth, at least you are getting a taste of what you're about to ingest because that taste has a direct link to your brain and I, I don't want to miss out on that. So, But to, to actually have a drink, I find it a little bit hard to swallow. Uh, oh, yeah, and that um, uh, Trapala is actually wonderful for um, all the doshas, so it balances all of them. Okay, demulcents. I know I have to say something about anticholine glycoside, so just put my finger there in case I haven't put it on here. Demulcents soothe and protect. So we're looking at chickweed. Um, it's a very uh, sweet. You can add it in with your salad. Uh, a lot of your bitter herbs will go really well with um, chickweed. Do not mistake it with petty sturge. Terrible, terrible mistake. Um, so if you're not sure, just break the chickweed. It will have no white sap. If it's got white sap, do not ingest it. It's probably pretty spurge. In the early stages, they can be very similar. In the later stages, definitely not. But in the early, early, early stages of about three or four leaves, they can. Um, chickweed, Celeria media, is a wonderful herb. I particularly like it um, because it is one of those beautiful spring greens that come up after uh, winter to, you know, we've eaten a little bit of stodgy foods and we may have a little bit of fat built up in our system. And so it just it, it just emulsifies. That's what it does. It emulsifies the fats. Um, it also can emulsify cysts. Um, uh, but you've got to be careful if you're going to juice it. That's all I can say. Uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful herb. Aloe vera. Uh, oh, I just love aloe vera. My aloe vera juice workshop is really well received and I'm getting such lovely feedback of people making their own aloe vera juice. Um, I don't use the yellow sap. That's an antroquinone glycoside. Antroquinone glycoside can really overstimulate the peristalsis of the bowel and you can end up with all sorts of problems. You can use it, but you have to uh, use some calmative herbs and it's only used for a very short term. While aloe vera, it, it, it sort of soothes and, and protects and you know, it can be used uh, a little bit longer and it has some wonderful effects on the bowel. Now, uh, licorice root, if it's for you, it's not for everyone. Um, licorice root is another wonderful soothing, protecting, demulcent uh, herb. Slippery elm, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful plant. And marshmallow root. <coughs> marshmallow root, one of my favourites, sweet. Um, also marshmallow root. Um, which is a cold water um, decoction. I make it up in summer and, you know, when we get that really dry spell, that it's a bit, it's hard to absorb water even though you're drinking a bit like the soil, you put it on but it just runs off. Then a little bit of marshmallow root decoction in your water as you, you're drinking just sort of helps it go into your cells. So it's quite wonderful. Um, stimulate the bowel. So here we go. We're going to talk about endocrinoid glycosides a little bit more. Burdock root is... Um, is a wonderful one for stimulating your bowels. 
Uh, yellow dark, it's probably one of the gentlest of the um, endocrine glycosides. It can be used for a little bit longer. And there's a picture of um, yellow dark. Uh, when you harvest yellow dark, it's got a really bright yellow root. Very hard to harvest, but it goes really deep into the grounds. It likes really swampy areas. I'm not growing it on my property yet. I don't think I've ever grown it, but I have seen it in the wild. And it's just hard to find a place of the you can be 100% sure it hasn't been sprayed. So you've got to find someone on somebody's private property. Uh, black walnut. Um, caution with endocrine glycosides, laxative, so uh, things like cinepods, um, casea. You, you just got to be a little bit careful. Like I said, they, they have a very impressive, uh, quick uh, stimulation of the peristalsis of the bowel, which make you go. Um, but used over a long period of time, it, it gives you almost a neurotic bowel. You know, the, the peristalsis gets all distorted. Um, these herbs are not suitable for irritable bowel syndrome or loose motions. Lymphatic system. Oh, I really better get a uh, yeah, look. The lymphatic system is a major component of the immune system, as well as providing a series of drainage channels to allow excess fluids into the spaces between body cells to empty into the veins. Very important in supporting the efficient removal of waste products and toxins from the body. Lymphatic herbs can help ease congestion and eliminate channels of the body. Violet, I just love violets. Lymphatic stimulant herbs. Violets. I don't use the root, okay. The root is more potent. I just haven't got the experience in using the root, but I have got experience in using the leaves and the flowers, and they work really, really well. Uh, don't eat too many flowers. Um, you may find yourself uh, going to the toilet a bit more regularly than you wish. Um, but, yes, you can eat the flowers and you can put the small leaves in your salad. Um, I make a beautiful um, infused oil of violets for external use, and it really helps drain the lymphatic system, especially if you've got ear aches and also uh, benign of normal growth. Uh, in your breast or anywhere in your body, and also internally as a fresh plant teacher. I just love them. Violet's beautiful. Cleavers is another one, just, you know, they're, they're everywhere. That's um, the ones that are also called the Velcro plant. They stick to you. That's where they got the idea of Velcro. Uh, wonderful lymphatic cleanser. Makes a really black um, fluid extract and uh, wonderful tea. No, and they don't taste too bad. What else have I got? Marigolds, of course. The calendula officinalis. And they're also um, yellow, yellow, the colour yellow, yellow bile. They have some um, stimulating effect on the liver as well as balancing hormones. And echinacea root, um, wonderful lymphatic. Then we've got our blood cleansers, inverted commas, tonics, the ultratives. Okay, nettles. Now, nettles are very interesting. The whole plant, the roots. So if you look up the roots of nettle, I've given you an article there because I, I, I sort of had a feeling we were going to run out of time. Okay, so <clears throat> UDA lectin has properties that may be worthy of consideration in the anti-coronavirus agent. Um, and that was for an article by uh, Stephen, oh no, Peter, Peter Damada which is the guy that, you know, eat for your body type. But, yeah, look, uh, the roots are amazing. I've always used them for prostate, but it's more than that. And, and you can read that article and find out just how amazing it is. I have actually bought um, organic nettle root because I've started to use a lot more than I could harvest. So if anybody wants any, you know, I sell them for $5 a packet and you can start making decoctions and drinking. It's not a bad tea. But, you know, nettles, um, once upon a time, was... Uh, uh, was used very similar um, for fibre as cannabis. And back, uh, they reclassified it, but at one stage it was actually linked in the same family as cannabis. So um, definitely doesn't have any mind altering effect. Um, but nettles are just so nutritious. And the seeds, you know, they, they've got omega-3, omega-6s. They've got the, um, you know, they're just wonderful for your hormone system. Uh, then the leaves are so cleansing. Hay fever, if somebody mentioned about hay fever. Um, Dingy is wonderful for hay fever, as is other herbs in mine. Hay fever mix. Um, it's helped a lot of people. Wonderful, wonderful cleansing herb. 
uh, and nutritive herb, you know. I labelled it Mother Nature's multivitamin because the more that I studied about nettles, the more I went, oh, my God, you are just so amazing. Garlic, wonderful. Turmeric, echinacea, sarsaparilla, burdock, borage, donkai. Now, with borage, um, yeah, it's a scheduled herb. Not meant to use it. Um, but, you know, if you, they're prickly leaves, but you can just chop up a leaf really finely and um, put it in your salad. But I actually like porridge a lot. Um, so with the porridge, I'll have to cross out the leaves and put flowers. should have been flowers. So you put your flowers in your um, salad and have some beautiful blue added to it. Okay, ways to use herbs for detoxification. I don't know if I've got anything else for vegetables. Okay, I think. Okay. Um, teas are by far the best, um, by far the best, the purifying effect of plants are enhanced by the high water content and the absence of any other additives. I think when talking cleansing, um, teas do a remarkable job. Just going to have really good quality plants to start with. Um, other things do a remarkable job too, but I, I really think for cleansing, you know, getting um, teas, almost broths like of plant. Uh, juicing of some herbs is appropriately careful on the dose. Start with very low dose as they can be much stronger. Um, juicing is fantastic for cleansing, and we all know about the benefits of celery juice. Tinctures and extracts have a deeper detoxifying and are best carried out under supervision of a herbal practitioner. If you're new in herbal medicine, I really highly recommend that. You know, you, you need support and uh, a fun practitioner you can work with and they will help you and guide you. Foods that assist and detoxify. So we've got onion, garlic, ginger, sulfur-containing, circulating enhancing. We've got chilies, increased circulation, turmeric, watermelon, antioxidant compounds. And these are by no means the only ones. There's so many more. Pineapple, papaya, protease enzyme, reduce excess protein accumulation, and toxic byproduct breakdown. And your cabbage, your broccoli, beautiful sulfur antioxidant compounds, green, lots of greens, especially raw, are considered the most overall detoxifying vegetables available. Citrus antioxidant compounds include vitamins, mineral, and phytonutrient. Cleansing and fasting, just a little word about cleansing and fasting. Caution with total fasting. They can modify your fast. If you, if you are into fasting, you know what your body can and can't do. Um, cleanse the body gently and safely. Healing crises often stirred up the toxins too fast. So try and avoid that. Um, best to have a personal individualised, personal environment is a better option. So really other work with someone or if you're going to do it, just don't be too heroic. And what I mean by that is don't go too hard on it, you know, listen to your body. And some people can't go without food for, you know, more than 12, 14 hours. You know, they may have some sugar imbalances in the body. Um, so listen to your body and see what you can do. But, you know, eating less, drinking more water, having herbal teas, um, you know, going um, vegetarian for a little while. It's very cleansing. Cleans vegetarian diets are very cleansing diet. Um, juice, vegan, raw foods provide nutrients to you, but to make sure you've got that. Um, and, you know, just remember that spring is the ultimate time for cleansing. Now, some people, and I don't know why, feel like they need to cleanse all the time. I'm not a fan of that. I think there's a time to cleanse, there's a time to, um, to nourish and, and, and nurture, and there's a time to rest and time to be active, of course. Um, colonics and hydrotherapies, uh, they're out there. Um, my experiences are very good. However, when you look at colonics, um, I have found that if you use them too often, it's again, you know, you're stripping all the good bacteria out and that's not favourable. Um, but they do definitely do have a place. Uh, caution, detoxifying can lead to a release of toxin within the system, can include headaches, skin rashes, nausea, fatigue, irritability, altered bowel habits, flatulence, etc. Be gentle, seek professional advice if symptoms persist. Um, avoid during pregnancy and lactation, that just makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? 
uh, avoid serious medical conditions unless under supervision of a healthcare professional, and be cautious if you're on pharmaceutical medication. Please take note, pharmaceutical drugs and herbs, um, make sure there is no contraindications, know your limitation, consult a healthcare professional, and be 100% sure before ingesting and applying any herbs. Now, I've got this beautiful picture of St John's wort that grows in my garden. I love St John's wort. Now, you will notice that St John wort is one herb that often, if you are on pharmaceutical medication, it's one that you can't take. Um, more often than not, the reason for that is, I mean, uh, if you're on sedatives, it's because of the serotonin um, effect. But more than not, it's because it's a very powerful uh, phase two liver detoxification. So it really detoxifies things really quickly. And it's also a wonderful antiviral. And, uh, you know, due to our current situation, um, you know, keeping your immune system um, supporting your immune system and keeping yourself healthy is something that I think everybody has taken a little bit more note of late. And, you know, there is so many antiviral herbs out there in the plant kingdom. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to get exotic ones from overseas. They, they are just in our habitat. And uh, it's my greatest pleasure to share with you um, those plants so that you can learn to use them safely and free. Um, herbal wisdom. Herbs are concentrated foods with vital nutrients, um, vitamins and medicinal properties. They have a special restorative value to the human body. This knowledge is not difficult to understand and as I've said before, it is very extensive. So thank you for attending today. Take care of yourself and your family and may you enjoy the herbs in your garden as much as I do. And there's my last slide. I'll leave that slide up and take some questions from Tracy. I think I've been pretty well on time. <laughs> yeah, you've done well. It's all good. Thank um, you. I'm just going to scroll back and find some of these questions for you. Just bear with me. Okay, so Nicole says as an asthmatic, she mm. knows that allergies and asthma are linked. Should she take herbs for the liver to assist with the asthma? Yes. Yes. Um Pretty well, everybody needs to take herbs for the liver, I think, in today's climate. There is, you know, the liver detoxifies. Uh, everything's got to go through the liver. Um, so, you know, we we have choices in um, trying to eliminate some of these toxins that are coming in, and, and sometimes we don't have a choice. You know, the air that we breathe, it's very hard to, um, to have a choice in that. And, and then sometimes the food that we buy, you know, sometimes we, we may not have be able to get good quality organic food. So, yeah, the liver's always, always address the liver, you know. Um, and asthma can be linked to a lot of things um, and there is things that you can do. So, again, going back to, you know, you've got asthma and you know that you've got hay fever. And so there is a, there is a respiratory uh, compromise there. What's the cause of that? Is it coming from the gut? Which, of course, the liver is part of that gut function. Okay, um, is it a hereditary thing? No. Um, what else is going on with that person? And don't forget the emotions. Don't forget the emotions. <laughs> Please don't forget the emotions. Um, you know. Um, so, yes, my my answer to that is yes. Always look at the liver. Excellent. Um, Divya says she has nasturtium flowers in the back garden, and are these okay to eat? And also, how many should she eat at a time? Oh, yes, I forgot about these nasturtiums. They are absolutely amazing. Look, don't overdo it. Uh, being a sulfur compound, they can make you puke if you have too many. Um, um, I can't remember the dose, but most people that I speak to um, have a couple of flowers. Always start with one and see how you go. And I think, you know, most people have a couple. And the leaves are very um, peppery, so you can cut up a couple of, depends how big your leaves are, a couple of small leaves and pot them in your... Um, in your salad, but yeah, they're absolutely amazing. And you know, um, the stations, um, there was an antibiotic, I can't remember the name of the antibiotic that they derived from the nasturtium plant. Um, so they have a, a wonderful uh, antibiotic uh, property for colds and flus as well. And to be honest with you, I did make a fresh plant tincture of it. 
that doesn't get used a lot because I just find the best way to take them is like a food because you don't need a lot of them. So, yeah, thank you for bringing the nasturtiums. Like I said, I haven't included everything by no means. And, um, yeah, they've just gone absolutely wild in my front garden. Yeah, nasturtiums, wonderful. Excellent. Um, I have to look up the actual dose, but if you, if you start off with one and just build up to two or three, you'll be fine. Great. Uh, Vic says he has a weed that grows prolifically and looks like parsley but on long stems. Can you tell what this is from the description and if it's good for anything because he doesn't want to kill something that may be useful? <laughs> Was that Nick? Uh, Vic. Vic. Oh, Vic, bless you. Um, there were so many plants in that family and the parsley family, the Embracia family, I uh, always call it the umbrella family. That's how I remember it. You know, the flowers look like an umbrella. Um, are probably the most toxic. So as soon as we're talking about that family, I go, whoa, caution, caution, caution. Um, uh, and plus I don't like to identify anything unless I see it because it's that 100% surety. So what I'm going to say to Vic is, you know, bring me the plant. If I can identify it, um, you know, I'll be happy to. And if I can't, maybe I can send you to someone that might be able to, you know. So it's about sharing our herbal knowledge and keeping all this knowledge alive in our community. But, yeah, for now, yeah, don't kill her, but don't eat it, <laughs> okay? Um, and these some of the most impressive plants are in that family, but they're some of the most poisonous. And one of them is, um, you know, poison hemlock. It comes from the parsley family, <laughs> just to give you an example. Yeah, but if you come into the talk, you know, Wonderful time to bring it along then. But if you're not coming, I'm sorry, to the walk and talk. Um, but if you're not coming, you know, just, just contact me and uh, leave uh, a sample in a in a, uh, in a a bag. So what you do is you get those lock bags and you just put your sample in there, breathe a bit of air into it, zip it, and just leave it um, at my front door and I'll have a look at it. Excellent. Um, Vic also wanted to know what is the proportion of black pepper to turmeric, please, to help activate? Oh, good question. I've got the recipe somewhere. Uh, I don't know technically the dose, but I know that when I cook, depending on how much you're making, I usually go a good ground teaspoon of black pepper to a good, um, you know, couple of um, dessert spoons of um, turmeric. But, you know, um, that's very vague. So uh, easily available online, that kind of information. Um, and I do have it when I have... Um, looked at turmeric and we did uh, little turmeric um, pastels in class. So I run the, um, for those that don't know, I've been running a family herbalist class for quite a while now, going into oh, five years, four years, four years this year, five years next year. Um, been very challenging with COVID-19, but I managed to get all my students through this year. I just haven't taken any new ones on. Um, but that's the sort of things we look at. We look at recipes, we do things together. Uh, it's quite an, an extensive course, um, but we've had a lot of fun with it. And the Family Herbalist course is, is just that. It's to, it's to keep that knowledge alive in our community and assist you to make better health choices for yourself and your family. And um, I know that in that course we've got that recipe with all the um, in proportions of what to use, but I can't remember offhand. Excellent. Um, Hayden says he remembers an old American folk song that was about moonshine made from juniper berries. Is that why it may not be recommended for people with liver or kidney problems? <laughs> yeah, well, gin, <laughs> juniper. And, of course, we've been, we've been getting quite a lot of um, gin makers uh, on the scene again, have you noticed? Um, but gin's got juniper berries. Um, yeah, look, juniper berries are absolutely amazing. Um, and often people don't think of it as a very powerful antiviral as well. Um, but the big question, is it for you? And what I say to people, you can easily buy juniper berries, um, you know, and just put one in your mouth and let it dissolve and see what it does for you. Like I said, this um, recent client, um, she got a little bit nauseous, um, you know, so um, it may not be for her or it may be for her, but she needs to just have it every second day. Um, but, you know, the dose, the liver cleanse write-up that I've got, um, you just need a little small packet of um, juniper and then you need the fresh plant tincture and you build up slowly. And the idea of building up slowly is you can keep check of that, okay? But definitely not for people with um, – and juniper is contraindicated for uh, any kidney problem. 
Mm. But uh, wonderful for a lot of people. Oh, yes. somebody's put up. Oh, good on you, Di. I can see Di has helped us out with the portion. There we go. And Vic wants to know regarding the Trifala powder, what name on the internet um, to look up for that one? Oh, for the write-up, you can buy Trifala powder from myself or health food shops. It, it, it is readily available. Um, I've got my students to buy their own capsule machine and make it themselves because it's so much cheaper to buy the powder compared to buying the capsules. And it's something that is going to be ongoing. So the name is Michael Tierra, T I E double R A. Michael Tierra. If you punch in Trafala Michael Tierra, then you'll get some of his lovely write ups about it. Yep, Michael Tierra, that's right. Yep, I can see things coming up in the, I, sort of, I can see the chat. Yes, yes wonderful. So I'll pop that in there for them. Yeah. Um, well, I think that is all we have time for this morning, Patricia. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wealth of valuable knowledge with us. It is just never ending, I feel. And you've given us lots of information this morning to naturally arm our bodies with as we move into the very highly anticipated seasons of spring and summer. So thank you. It's been my absolute pleasure. And this was my very first webinar because I'm a very interactive person. So I've kind of missed seeing everybody's faces. Um, but, yeah, it was okay. And I do prefer to see your faces and see how um, received no, I that's, use that. It's um, wonderful. You've done well. And, again, oh, I'll you. give the phone number to call to book into the um, Healing with Herbs walk yeah. and talk is 0427. Five nine four two seven nine, or uh, the email address is patricia at patriciabronzi.com. I have popped them in the chat if you want to quickly have a look before we end today's webinar. Yeah. Well, so I hope to see some of you. That would be lovely. Yeah, thank you again. And um, please keep following the Marion Library's Facebook page, the City of Marion website, and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations and workshops and if you haven't already registered next Wednesday on the 2nd of September we welcome special guest author Antonio Beauty to acknowledge Indigenous Literacy Day as he talks to us about his book The Stolen Life so I hope you will join us then thank you again Patrizia and goodbye everyone and thanks for joining us well enjoy the sunshine bye bye, -bye. <laughs>